Let's talk through the finest Orky forces in Warhammer 40k 10th edition with a tier list of the strongest and weakest units in the Greenskin Horde. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics where today we're talking Orcs and in this one we're going to be talking through each unit in the index, where I'd rank them in terms of power right now and why I'd rank them where I would. Currently in 10th edition, Orcs shaping up to be in maybe not a terrible spot, but perhaps not one of the most single standout strong armies of Warhammer 40k. They've definitely got their challenges, but they do have some good stuff, and can certainly meet out a decent amount of violence. In this video, we're going to talk through each unit in the index in turn, and for power rating, I've divided them up into six different tiers, starting with six, the lowest, and moving all the way along to the most standout things for the points cost. I'll also cover the Forge World choices in this, and talk a little bit about them as well then maybe a little bit more briefly, and we'll keep the focus on the main index units. As always with these, tier lists are a little bit arbitrary, some things could be ranked a little bit higher or lower, it kind of depends on your own army and tactics and playstyle, some units might be a really good fit, even if they're not generally considered to be the absolute strongest units in the index. And of course at the moment we are at least fairly early days in 10th edition, might be that there's a bunch of things that maybe just don't look as awesome on paper, but they're actually a bit stronger than people expect, or the other way around. To help with making this tier list, I did ask you guys for a community poll, so the list is largely based on that, but with a fair few units I have used a little bit of my own discretion, some things that seem to be cropping up a bit more than it was voted in tournament lists, plus roughly where to draw the boundaries between each tiers. Hopefully it should be at least some way to accurate, we'll talk through each unit and why I've ranked it where I would, so feel free to give me any alternate takes or out there uses for any of the units within. First up, we'll start out with some of the weaker units in the Orc Army list. These units I think are just a little bit on the overcosted side, and they could have significant points cuts before they'd really get particularly good. First up, we've got the Tank Busters for 135 points. No idea why these are quite so costly for just a unit of 5 of them. I kind of wonder if Games Workshop just doesn't want anyone to buy the Ancient Resin kit and wants to have the focus put on all their plastic units perhaps. They cost far too much for their defence, and unfortunately they are absolutely locked to the exact loadout that you get in the box now, so you have to pick up the rocket pistols and the tank hammer, even if you might have preferred to just focus on full squads of rockets. Even with the high points cost, their damage output isn't too bad against monsters and vehicles, they just still don't really seem like an efficient choice for that. I feel like these guys aren't really the tank killing nutcases that orcs really need them to be. Next up, we've got the Stomper at 800 points. I feel like this thing is always destined to be overcosted by Games Workshop. It does have mighty melee per point, but it's definitely at risk of being screened out by other cheap chaff units or things getting its way. The firepower, when not buffed, is kind of awful for Ballistic Skill 5+. Plus. I guess if you'd take a Stomper, you'd usually take one of the mechs to give it a Ballistic Skill 4+, plus, which would make it a bit better at least. Still, though, when this thing's 800 points and is almost half the points in your army, I just don't think that the firepower does quite enough compared with its equivalent in other units. You can put a serious amount of orcs on the table for this kind of cost. It is very tanky, with a big toughness 14, a 2 plus save, and a bunch of wounds, but still, at least per point, I think that the defence is still merely okay. It can just be a bit problematic for some armies with that dedicated anti-tank that might struggle to kill it even if they focus fire, though some armies in 40k absolutely can without too much difficulty still. Space Marines with Oath of Moments and big Eldar anti-tank damage still probably won't have too much trouble, particularly only with a 6 plus invulnerable. I feel like it's still in a position overall where it could probably need to drop around 100 to 200 points to be particularly good, and maybe not absolutely unusable if you wanted a fond list to build around one. Talking of absolutely unusable though, the Burner and Blitzer Bombers just are very sad for their profiles at the moment, 115 or 125 points, and these guys are just basically victims of Games Workshop's aircraft changes, with their bomb rules just basically kind of not really working right now. They have to start off the board as they don't have the hover keyword, it means that unless you spend command points and rapid ingress them, which probably isn't the best idea, he guarantees not to be able to bomb anything until at least turn 3, as they'll turn up on turn 2 and then not be able to move further, fire off with some mediocre shooting. And then even on turn 3, they've got a locked flight path, so the opponent knows exactly where they're going to go. If they really care about not being bombed, they could just move out the way. Between all those disadvantages, definitely not worth paying the points that you'd cost for them. If you're going flyers, it's probably worth getting one of the others with a direct damage output. Finally, we've got the Big Head Boss Bunker here. 135 points for an Orky Fortress that could be a little firebase in your own lines. It does have a big firing deck and is at least somewhat tough. But realistically, 135 points is just too much for this. You may as well just have them fire out of a cheap truck for 50 points. That just seems like a massively better idea. Plus, it's also mobile, so you can actually drive your orcs around in that. It does have a little bit of inaccurate shooting and helps out with orky leadership a tiny bit, but nothing that really justifies 135 points, in my opinion. 
Moving onwards and upwards in Tier 5, these ones I feel maybe aren't quite so bad compared with the lower tier, but still a bit overshadowed by various other choices. A few of the buggies, the remaining planes, and the Whirlboy. I feel like the Orky Mad Max buggy brigade didn't really get much of a boost going into 10th edition. A lot of their damage outputs dropped a bit, they lost the Ramshackle special rule, and perhaps most importantly they lost the Speedwire special rules that allow them to get extra AP and extra shots with DACA weapons and things, and any clans that help them out with shooting as well. I think a couple of them are still more interesting than these three. Here I've chosen to rank the Boom Dagger Snaz Wagon, with its average of around about 6 AP minus 1 strength 5 hits. Just really not all that good for 90 points. A Shock Jump Dragster, which had its damage output nerfed, and if you jump then it can't shoot anymore. Definitely not unusable for shenanigans jumping around the board and picking up some secondary points late game or something, but if you can't shoot then that's a bit sad. And the Mega Drag Scrapjet has had its damage output absolutely cut down. Massively less dangerous rockets, massively less dangerous melee, but it hasn't really gone down all that many points as a result. On top of that, all of its missiles are going to be wounding tanks on a 5 plus now, not on a 4 or better. So as well as hitting with a bunch less of them on average, you're also not going to be doing anywhere near as much threat to armour. Otherwise, also down here we've got a couple of the planes, the Wasp Bomb Blaster Jet and the Daka Jet. 175 for the first and 135 for the second. For these ones again I'd say that the firepower is kind of okay but not really stand out. They should be at least guaranteed some good line of sight on their targets and they can at least do their full damage output on the turn they come in, unlike the bombers. But again both of them had their damage output cut down a fair bit, particularly the blaster jet that used to be massively threatening with those enormous teleport blasters. Now it does a lot less damage. Again, like the buggies and the other flyers, losing speed war and freebooters style plus one to hit buffs, both of those hurt a fair bit, and I'm not really sure that these guys are properly worth starting off the board for this sort of firepower, particularly with limited movement options in the next turn. Finally for tier 5, we've also got the Whirlboy for 60 points. He is at least fairly cheap as a character, but just seems to be outshone by just about anything else. His Eyes of Mork can give you a bit of ranged damage, though it's heavily dependent on having an intact mob that hasn't taken some heavy casualties. Even when it's masked up, I feel like it only just gets to about justifiable for the points, as opposed to being really super scary. He does throw out some at least fairly scary battle shock with a minus to the leadership test as well, which is kind of okay. It'd be far more meaningful though if it could actually do things like affect enemy objective scoring or affect enemies falling back. In general, for enemies being battleshocked in your turn, the biggest impact is stopping stratagems, which can be handy for like interrupts and things, but still a little bit situational, and your opponent might often just not really care. Moving on, here in Tier 4, I'm a lot more positive about a bunch of these units. I still say they're maybe not some of the most exciting units in the codex, but are all a bit more usable. Perhaps often just a case of slightly more underwhelming stat lines, or only wanting one or two of them, as opposed to actually carrying the mainstay of the army. First up, we've got the War Bikers. 75 points for 3 or 150 for 6, I feel like they'd probably be towards the top of this tier. Pretty usable, fast moving anti-infantry, quite nice to be able to throw a few objective control points onto midfield objectives and bully any squads that are on there with AP-1 Dakar up close. They are the unit you'd need if you want to field death killer war trikes or war bosses on war bikes as well, both of which are okay units. I feel like perhaps they do compare a little bit poorly to squig hog boys for at least a somewhat similar role. They're kind of similar in terms of durability per point with their feel no pain type save, and they can be a little bit more anti-vehicle and monster with their beast snagger rules. Next up, I feel like Games Workshop's been at least fairly consistent with their orky walkers. Pretty much the killer cans, the death dread, and the gorkonaut and morkonaut at all ranked down in this tier basically getting similar sorts of damage and defence for the points that you invest in them at different levels, but maybe none of them enormously stand out to the extent where you'd want to be absolutely spamming loads of them in an army perhaps. The killer cans are still solid enough for getting a fair few wounds on the board for the points cost, 150 points for at least some fairly generalist melee and a bunch of somewhat accurate rocket shots. You probably could make an argument for Scorched as well in the age of Overwatch. I feel like the changes to vehicle toughness will make them a little bit sad, as they might struggle to punch up against some of the toughest armour around, wounding them on 5s when they might have been wounding on 4s or 3s before. They do suffer with some low leadership as well, which could make them a little bit more of a liability for objectives. I feel like they do their job kind of fine as just chaff walkers. The Death Dread went up in cost really quite significantly. It's a shame as his stat line got a massive boost from being kind of okay in 9th, to being at least somewhat generally scary and tanky with a 2 plus save and toughness 9. I think going up to 150 points though basically just means that he's still paying for that extra stat line. His Drake Laws do pack a fair punch in combat with a bunch of AP2 damage 3 attacks, and the custom Mega Blaster I think is at least scary enough, though it does risk some hazardous rolls. He could also go fairly heavy on the Scorchers here again as well if you wanted some big Overwatch. 
Finally, for the Orky Walkers, there's the Gorkonaut and Morkonaut, costing around about 300 points, and depending on whether you want souped-up melee from the Gorkonaut, or a fair bit of anti-tank shooting with the Morkonaut, both of which have the chance for a plus one to hit. They're at least fairly tanky, with a 3 plus save and a whole bunch of wounds and a high toughness value. Still though, for 300 points, I'd still say not entirely stand out for that, not more so than other units in the other armies. And again, I'd say it's enough to put them in an okay but not stand out position. I suppose you could transport a transported unit in their hull and get a bit more orky charging off at the same time, I guess. Next up, we've got the Burner Boys, who I'd also rank probably towards the top of this tier. I feel like they're just a little bit on the expensive side now. 65 for 5, 130 for 10, or 195 for 15. That cost would get you 4 flamers per squad of 5, plus either a rocket or custom mega blaster on the mech, who actually has a fair bit of threat. Again, they could be fun for overwatching units trying to take the midfield objectives. And in particular, they're quite nice for clearing objectives, getting to re-roll wound rolls against units that are on them. That's to really take the flamers to the next level. And they do have some combat threat as well, with AP-2 combat with their cutting flames, but they do hit on a 4+, plus with that. I think they're usable enough to go in transports for that kind of points cost. Ideally, you wouldn't want them getting shot first, though. I think it wouldn't be unreasonable to run them up in a truck or a battle wagon or something. Next up, we've got the Death Copters, 115 for 3 or 230 for 6. They're a bit cheaper in terms of points cost and not outstandingly so. I think they have lost a fair few benefits they did have last edition. Rockets just going from double the shots to twin links is a little bit on the sad side. Their melee isn't quite as punchy as it used to be, and I feel like they'll really miss that ramming speed stratagem that they had, potentially getting a 3d6 inch charge and mortal wound impact hits. That worked out quite nicely for them, as they could have a very nearly guaranteed charge out of Deep Strike. Overall now I'd say they're alright generalist skirmishers, paying a bit of a price tag for their deep strike and being at least some threats to infantry and vehicles. Maybe not an enormous amount of orky synergy though, and their bombing attack is a little bit lacklustre, though could be good for a couple of mortal wounds from time to time. The fly keyword change also hasn't helped them much either, they'll be having to go round terrain rather than straight over it as well, so their mobility has gone down quite a bit there. Next we've got the Hunter Rig for 180 points, Basically the bigger transport version of the kill rig, with the space for a whole load of beast nagger boys plus characters. If you want to get a massive 20 strong mob into battle, then this is the way to do so I suppose. Though I feel like in general probably paying the extra 40 points for the kill rig is perhaps still worth it. Getting the auto hitting word tower is very nice, plus the buffs and debuffs nearby. The kill rig can also have a 10 man beast nagger boys squad, plus also a beast boss in there as well if you want. So characters aren't quite as big an issue for it as they were before. Next up, we've got the other two boggies, the Rocket Truck Squig Boggy and the Custom Booster Blaster. The Rocket Truck's 110, so it's the most expensive one. The Custom Booster Blaster is 85, so at least somewhat cheap for that one. I still say that both of these have kind of lowish damage output for the cost, but both of them have an additional selling point that makes them a little bit better. The Rocket Truck Squig Boggy can be actually okay in terms of ignores line of sight damage output. You kind of need to target infantry as that gives you the plus one to hit against them, so you're not hitting on sixes. But occasionally just a few squigs raining down at strength 5 and damage 2 could be enough to kill that last model or 2 hiding on an objective, and that could be a big deal. Plus it does have a fun squig mine as well, a 50-50 chance for a fairly punchy d6 mortal wounds once per game for something that gets close, so it could be some nice insurance against getting charged, or you could drop it off against something unsuspecting nearby. The custom booster blaster is just fairly cheap and does do a little bit of damage with that rivet cannon. Probably the best thing though is handing out a minus 1 to hit for one enemy unit, I feel like for a cheap boggy for 85 points, that's really not bad. Might not be super relevant in every single game, but if you could fire that into a big Terminator block, or into an enormous Imperial Knight that's just about to do a whole load of damage, I feel like having just one in the army to irritate those kind of units could be worth the 85 points plus the actual damage it does. Next up, we've got the Mech Workshop for 80 points, a cheap fortification that just sits in your line and hands out some regeneration to nearby orky vehicles. The repairs it can do are actually kind of significant, basically D3 wounds regenerated automatically for each orc vehicle within 12 inches of it, and it can have a fairly wide profile as well. It could even be a little bit annoying for any enemy units trying to get into the deployment zone, potentially screening out some deep strikers or something if you put it along a flank. It's not super hard to kill for the cost, but that's maybe not entirely necessary at just 80 points. I feel like if you were going for an orc list that had an awful lot of vehicles, and you thought that at least a few of them would be able to stay in range of the mech workshop, I feel like you could probably justify your points cost for it there. Definitely not a bad thing to have hanging around to make your vehicles get bolted back together. Perhaps the main issue with it might be that orc vehicles aren't looking super strong right now for the most part. 
and some of the better ones might just want to be hurtling towards the enemy anyway and getting combat with things like battle wagons with death rollers or trucks delivering combat boys into battle. I think if there were points changes and the best things in the codex wound up being a whole bunch of vehicle units, then the mech workshop could definitely have a place. Next we've got the looters, who I do think have a slightly disappointing stat line. 2-3 to three shots at strength 8, AP 1 and damage 2 with a heavy keyword, either hitting on 6s if they move, or 5s if they stay stationary. I feel like over the past year or so, Games Workshop have just repeatedly dropped the points cost of looters, but still haven't managed to get them in a place where they're actually looking kind of good. The 10th edition version definitely does have its disadvantages, not really wanting to move at all is really quite a big problem. Though I feel like maybe the points cost getting into a place where it doesn't really matter all that much, and you could still justify taking a squad of them just literally to sit around in cover and plink off some shots. Now they're actually 11 points per model and get a 5 plus armour save, their durability isn't looking quite as utterly terrible as it used to be. The rockets or the custom Mega Blaster on the mech are actually okay for the cost as well, I think. And in general, if you wanted a bit more of a shooty horde as opposed to shooter boys, looters actually don't seem too terrible for that, looked at more as backup boys to a horde. With the damage output and the movement problems, plus very little range support available for the codex, I still don't think that they're super standout. Probably going to lose out in comparison with things like flash kits with Captain Badrock, but at 11 points, just a little bit less terrible than they used to be. Next up, we've got the Death Killer War Trike and the War Boss on War Bike, two kind of similar units. The Bike Boss is a Imperial Armor data sheet. Both of these bosses are somewhat tanky and bring another Power Claw equivalent to the War Biker Squad, making them into a bit more of a combat unit than one that's kind of balanced between shooting and melee. I think they're not too bad for their own raw stats. They are both pretty tanky, particularly the Death Killer War Trike at nine wounds on a character. Again, though, with the war bikers, I think when taken as a combined proposition for the bosses plus the war bikers, they maybe don't compare amazingly well with their equivalent points in, say, Squig Hog Boys and perhaps Beast Bosses on Smasher Squigs, even if they can be targeted directly. Just seems like if you're adding some mounted characters and the units into the Orky Horde, then you might go for them first. For another Orky character that's maybe a tiny bit on the underwhelming side is the war boss in Mega Armor. 95 points and a fair few strength 9 damage 2 attacks with that huge chopper. It's fairly tanky and does give the Mega Knob squad a plus 1 to hit. Not too bad given that they hit on 4s innately, but I feel like he's rarely going to be your first choice to lead the Mega Knob squad. They've got a couple of very tempting options, including the sort of pseudo Orky Apothecary Big Mech and Mega Armor, plus Gazgol Thracker himself, who adds a lot more damage output, plus his own fairly immense stats. I think he's definitely not unusable though, would certainly be a scary squad to have him, plus a whole bunch of 3 plus hitting mega knobs. I guess somewhat depends on whether you want more damage or more defence. Finally, I've also ranked a bunch of the maybe slightly less exciting Forge World choices here. Again, like the rest of these, I don't really feel like they're entirely unusable, just maybe aren't quite as exciting for the stats as a bunch of the stuff that I've ranked higher up. Here we've got the knob bikers, maybe in a somewhat similar place to the war bikers seem to get pretty much equivalent boosts for the cost. The Grot Mega Tank, which doesn't seem to be quite as standout as the regular Grot Tanks for the amount of wounds put on the board. The Mega Dread and the Mecha Dread, which seem at least somewhat balanced with the other various flavours of Orky Walker. And the Big Track, which I don't really think adds enough for the extra 25 points compared with the very cheap truck. Moving on though, we get to Tier 3. These are Orky units that I think are getting really quite scary now. Maybe a little bit more likely to be taken in competitive lists. So I'd maybe expect a few of the other units to be taken in competitive lists a little bit more regularly than these. Starting out, we've got one that's right on the borderline, which I could have very happily ranked up in Tier 2, which are the Flash Gits plus Captain Badruck, actually putting out a very serious amount of firepower for the points cost now, and can certainly follow up with a charge with a bunch of Strength 5 AP1 melee to bully any light infantry you might have. The Flash Gits are 95 points for 5, or 190 for 10. They pump out around 3 or 4 shots at Strength 6 AP1 and Damage 2, hitting on 5s on the move and 4s if they're stationary, and they can also get lethal hits for them once per game as well. If you're taking a bigger squad of 10 of them, I feel like Badrock's probably an auto-include. Rerolling hit rolls is pretty excellent with kind of poor ballistic skill like this, particularly in the turn where they get lethal hits. Rerolling and fishing for 6s, you could both be getting exploding 6s and auto-wounds on the go. I chips in with his own Da Ripper as well. A bunch of strength 8, AP3 and damage 3 certainly rounds out the unit and makes them a bit more scary against tough stuff. Overall, I do think they're quite a strong unit, jumping out of some sort of transport like a battle wagon perhaps, and could use the new transport rules to get them exactly where they need to be. Like I said, I could have very happily ranked them up in tier 2. Perhaps the main concern is their firepower just is still a little bit not that generalist against tougher stuff, wounding on 5s or 6s against tanks and things will be a bit unfortunate for them if they happen to be playing against some heavy armour. Next up, we've got the Battle Wagon, which is now a lot more expensive at 185 points. 
Not quite as cheap and cheerful as it used to be, but with the 10th edition war gear changes, you get all the fancy stuff thrown in. You can load up with kill cannons, a bunch of shooters, lobbers and wrecking balls, plus the death roller. And the battle wagon itself did get a debuff to enemy AP as well, reducing the AP by 1. Effectively being basically the equivalent of a 2 plus save against quite a lot of shooting, plus might be able to get itself cover as well. I think it's really quite a nice alternative to a truck to deliver certain bigger units to the fray. The new transport rules can allow it to move and disembark as well, and then hopefully follow things up with a death roll or charge. Can be quite nice for tank shock as well if you fancy getting some mortal wounds. Storm Boys are 65 points for 5 of them, or 130 for 10. At 13 points per model, they're definitely paying a bit of a premium for their mobility, but that mobility really is quite serious. Being able to advance and charge with a base 12 inch movement outside the war plus the advantages of being fly infantry to hop around terrain for no problems. Both of those things are very nice indeed, and you could be charging enemy units that might have thought they were safe a long way away. Could be nice for jumping around the board for getting tactical objective points as well. Always nice to have a unit that can threaten to move quite this far. Again, could have been a tempting one to put up towards tier 2. The 13 points is paying a bit of a premium, I suppose. Next up, for 85 points, we've got the standard boys. 85 for 10 or 170 for 20. I'd say probably lagging a little bit behind the Beast Snagger boys for the extra things that they get for the extra 20 points between Feel No Pains and Strength 5 and things. Not really loads in it though, and these guys do get their own advantages. They're a little bit more cheap and cheerful, so the durability per point should be a touch better, even though they don't hit with Strength 5 chopper attacks. I think they remain a solid choice to just push a whole bunch of objective control 2 units up to the midfield and then hopefully be able to bully enemy light infantry. Toughness 5 and a 5 plus save should actually give them some sort of play against small arms more than they did before perhaps. After the two are certainly still being tempted by sluggers over shooters. I feel like you're better off having the AP1 melee rather than a bunch of inaccurate AP0 shooting. The kill rig's gone up in cost a bit in 10th edition to 220 points. I feel like overall it's a little bit pricier and has lost a couple of its many advantages that it had last edition. Things like slowing things down with the heavy lobber. Not being a character for certain synergies. And it also means it's a bit less standout with getting the war benefits like the advance and charge as everything gets that full stop now. The word tower I still think is interesting with a little bit of psychic auto hitting overwatch though. That could be worth one command point if it gives you a chance to finish off something big before it strikes in the enemy army. It still seems okay for transporting beast snagger boys, get a mob of them up the board and then lend a hand in combat with a bunch of general purpose attacks, a lot of which wound vehicles and monsters on a 4+. Next up we've got a whole bunch of characters, most of which I think are at least fairly usable for the points, and again at least a couple of these I think I could have happily ranked up towards tier 2. For ones that are ranked towards the top of tier 3 at least, the knob with the war banner I think is rather good for 70 points. He chips in with a few power claw style attacks, but his main benefit is to get you a second turn of the war for one unit. Could be nice for getting knobs with a 5 plus invulnerable save, plus advance and charge for a second turn. Both boys or knobs might lead that, but I can't help but think that knobs are usually going to want to have a war boss lead them to get that minus one to wound that they get with him. And both boys and knobs have really quite a lot of options for characters to lead them, so this guy's competing against a bunch of other stuff. The big mech with a custom force field is cheap, but maybe a little bit whatever. A 4 plus or a 5 plus invulnerable save for your units logging up the board. I think he's fair enough with most reasonably high investment squads. We'll be fine with a big bunch of boys, or maybe even some looters camping out and providing some dacker. And the Weird Boy is another one as maybe tempted to rank up towards tier 2. He is very cheap at only 55 points and can have the chance of jumping a squad around the board. Teleporting Orcs definitely have a lot of advantages for getting the jump on the foe. Could be pretty handy for going after objectives or just coming at the enemy for an unexpected and unhelpful angle. And they could get at least a fairly reliable charge off if they use the plus 2 to charge stratagem for a 7 inch one. If you are budgeting in a command reroll for that as well then that's going to be a lot of CP. And you wouldn't be able to do that turn 1 a lot of the time. Still though definitely could be very problematic to have the opponent's units charged by 20 boys right from turn 1. And hopefully pin them in their deployment zone a bit. Maybe he should be up in tier 2 for that alone. Next up we've got the pain boys. The pain boss is 70 points, the pain boy 80 and the mad dog is 75. These will give a 5 plus fill no pain type save to the units that they can join. The pain boss is restricted to beast snagger boys. I feel like overall probably the best of them is perhaps the standard pain boy. Beast snagger boys already have a feel no pain type save. So perhaps the extra 5 plus isn't quite as big a deal. And both the pain boy and the pain boss have the option to regenerate d3 models to the squad. Both of which are really quite nice. I do even quite like the pain boy's potential mortal wound attack with his erty syringe. That could be quite nice for a bunch of surprise mortal wounds. Never mind his power claw style melee. 
I feel like Mad Doc Grotsnake's probably a little bit behind the two, as he doesn't get the regenerate D3 models rule. I'm not sure his slightly boosted combat stats and the fall back and charge thing really make up for that. Overall, the Pain Boy's probably my favourite, but the Orc units do have really quite a lot of competition for characters to lead them these days. Finally, for Orky characters in this tier, we've got the Big Mech with the Shock Attack Gun. Fairly cheap at 75 points, hitting on a 5 if he's moving or a 4 if static. With D6 plus 1, Strength 9, AP 4 and Damage D6 shots, plus he gives his unit a reroll wands to hit, so that could be kind of nice for mech guns perhaps. Looks like in a unit of 3 of them, he'd probably be efficient enough to justify his inclusion. I think even with that though, it is kind of close between that and just buy more mech guns if you want them. Boss Zagstruck for 100 points now actually does something useful to give his Storm Boys plus 1 to hit. He does make a squad of them quite a lot more threatening. You could have him in a 10-man squad for 230 points, and he does chip in with his own Strength 8, AP 2, and Damage 2 Vulture Claws. If you want a big threatening Storm Boy unit, looks like he's the way to go with them. Again though, like the Storm Boys, I feel like he does pay a bit of a premium for his good movements, and his fairly generalist melee. 100 points is quite a bit more than several of the other bosses, like say the War Boss and the Beast Boss. Finally in this tier, I've chosen to rank what I'd pick as perhaps the stronger Forge World units. I think a bunch of these are really quite interesting and would perhaps rank among the stronger vehicles in the army. The little Grot tanks actually put a surprising amount of wounds on the board for 155 points for four of them. 20 wounds at toughness 6 with a 3 plus save at that points cost isn't too bad. They've got one of those reactive movement rules as well, so they can react to enemies moving too close to them, and they can put out some good rocket fire with the blast keyword. I feel like for a durable little vehicle battle line, they are kind of fun. The Gargantuan Squiggoth is 440 points, an enormous great big titanic transport with toughness 13 and 30 wounds. That's enough to shrug off some pretty serious anti-tank firepower with las cannons wounding it on a 5+, plus. and its melee is perhaps surprisingly mighty with an enormous damage 12 on the big hitting attack out of those tusks, all while having an interesting transport option to get some boys to the front line as it goes about and does its thing smashing into the enemy army. Could probably have some issues being screened out with chaff units due to being a groundbound monster with an absolutely enormous profile, but on paper at least seems fairly good for the points cost. The regular Squiggoth could be basically a cheapish battle wagon alternative with a bit less transport capacity. It has a bit of a different flavour of melee, with a bunch of strength 12 damage d6 attacks rather than the battle wagon's mass death roller attacks. Could be okay for the points difference, though I feel like the battle wagon probably pips it out just a little bit. And finally we've got the kill tank, a pretty tough profile with toughness 12 and 24 wounds, and a fairly powerful main gun with 3d6 shots at strength 14, AP 2 and damage 3. They hit on a 4 plus within half range, which is ideally where you'd want to be for that. I feel like it's maybe one of the better Orky anti-tank weapons, but still that is really quite a heavy points cost. I guess it could have that big damage output with hitting on 4 plus outs to its full 36 inches if you have a mini mech nearby. All of those do seem at least pretty usable on paper. Kind of fun to see Grot tanks as somewhat good. Next up, we're moving on to Tier 2. These are models that are considered to be some of the strongest Orc units in the Index, probably going to be quite popular tournament picks. I have chosen to rank just a very few select units slightly higher than these up in Tier 1. First up, the standard Knob Squad still packs at a decent punch, 115 points or 230 for 10. They can get Mass Power Claws at Strength 9, AP 2 and Damage 2, and are really quite a nice unit to have characters in. They're quite a powerful choice to run with either that Knob with the War Banner, or a pain boy for some feel no pains and revivals, but they're particularly good with a war boss as he gives them a minus one to wound the unit, making them surprisingly tanky for their durability profile. I think they're a very strong option for jumping out of battle wagons or trucks as well, getting really quite a lot of green skin violence concentrated in not that many transport slots. They don't take up quite as much space as mega armor. Next, we've got the squig hog boys, and I thought we'd talk about the knob with a smasher squig here as well. There are 110 points or 220 for six of them. They did go up a bit in points, but you get the bomb squigs included now, and they got a rather good durability boost, going up to a very big toughness 7, and also picking up a 5 plus feel no pain, which is pretty excellent on multi wound models like these. As shock cavalry, they are generally quite an effective unit against most things they might want to target as well. Their normal profiles should deal with infantry fairly well, and the sticker also gets the anti vehicle 4 plus, plus the lance special rule as well. Wounding most things on a 4 plus or occasionally better is generally a good place to be in. I feel like these guys are something that most units in the enemy army at least have to worry about a bit. I think if you're taking a bigger mob of them with six of them, then it could well be worth upgrading to the knob with a smasher squig in the unit. He's got a big chopper with anti-vehicle and anti-monster 3 plus, which will give them some additional bite against the heaviest targets, and also give them a plus one to hit across the unit too. 
quite a powerful boost to how threatening they are, even if they might not be quite as tanky on an individual basis as the other Squig Hogs. Seems like a fairly solid unit. Kind of a shame though that he lost any sort of mortal wound impact hits from that Smasher Squig, that was kind of his signature move last time. Sticking with the Beast Snaggers, we've also got the Beast Snagger Boys. As I said, with the regular boys, probably a little bit stronger just on a per model basis, though the regular boys do have a fair few more character options to join them other than the standard Beast Boss and Pain Boss. They cost a bit more at 105 points over 85, and they get a clutch of rather nice advantages, strength 5 melee attacks, 6 plus fill no pains, and re-rolling hits against the big stuff like monsters and vehicles, maybe just in a similar sort of way as the Knob Squad as well, condensing more violence and melee damage into relatively fewer models for transport capacity, that can be handy enough as well. I'd say perhaps the best role is to be an escort for the Beast Boss though, he's quite a good data sheet. Next up we've got the Mech Guns at 45 points per model, you can take 1-3 to three units in the squad. Again, kind of similar to last edition, I still think that the cost of Mega Cannons do seem like the most reliable all-round way to go. D6 shots at strength 12, AP2 and damage D6 probably looks like the single most cost-effective way for Orcs to handle enemy vehicles at longer range. I still at least fairly tanky for that points cost with a bunch of wounds even if their save isn't great. And on average they should actually be taking a little bit less damage from the hazardous rule than they were before, though there's not loads in it. The 10th edition blast rule is also quite nice for the cost of Mega Cannon as well. That could definitely add up to a few more shots against some really big infantry units, and you also get to re-roll ones against enemy units that have got 10 or more models in, so it does help make them a bit more of a well-rounded gun, even if they are probably best still against tanks. I think as before, with their low mobility, probably not something to go absolutely mad on, but it seems nice to have at least a few of. The leadership issues that they have aren't really anywhere near as bad as they were previously. They do have good chance of failing Battleshock, but that might not matter all that much, as they'll still be doing their damage output. Next up for stronger Orc units, I've chosen to rank the Mega Knobs here. I feel like again they're probably one of the ones that I could have put at the borderline between lower tier 2 or upper tier 3. I feel like their base profile is kind of good, but you don't get all that many attacks out of them, particularly when they're hitting on a 4+. plus. They've got okay defence though, toughness 6 and a 2+, plus save. Their damage output can threaten the really big stuff as well, so it's nice to have something general purpose. Strength 12 kill saws with okay AP, and potentially re-rolling wounds if you take a pair of them. Every hit will be pretty likely to put a dent in the biggest stuff around, and they do also get devastating wounds in the war as well, which is pretty nice. I think their leaders perhaps take them to the next level though, the Mega Armor Mech allows you to resurrect some, as we'll get to in a second, and if you're taking Gazgol Thracker, you're probably taking a squad of these along, he makes them significantly more scary as well as adding his own melee threat. Finally for the slightly more battle line units before getting into characters, next up we have the Commandos, 135 points for infiltrating orcs that get stealth for a minus 1 to hit, they don't get quite as excessive days in cover anymore, but they'll still get a 4+, plus if they can get the benefit of cover. The new Orky armor save is kind of nice. You do have to take 10 of them, rather than individual disruptive units of 5, which I think is a bit of a weakness. But I think that they've got enough melee threat and damage to actually make themselves work as a potential early game alpha strike type unit. They could potentially charge and kill a bunch of enemy units if you get to go first. Lots of chopper attacks, unleashing bomb squigs and a couple of damage to melee attacks in the unit with that breach ram and the power claw. They also get a distraction grot for a 5 plus invulnerable save once per game, and are immune to overwatch as well, which can be quite a big deal in 10th for certain units. Next up, into some characters, and first off we've got the standard war boss and the beast boss, both of which are really quite cheap and effective characters now, 70 points for the war boss and 80 for the beast boss, solid combatants with a flurry of damage to attacks with medium to high strength, and they give plus one to hit for their units as well. A nice solid combat boost to go with the rest with the exploding sixes and everything else that the orcs get. The standard war boss gets his attack squig for a few extra hits, plus a massive great big plus four attacks in the war, so he really is in big damage mode there. The beast boss gets a bit more flexibility with melee, with the option for the beast chopper or the claw as makes sense. Personal devastating wounds when it's on the charge, which is always nice to have. Some anti-vehicle on the go, and also a six plus feel no pain. Probably overall, point for point, the Beast Boss is a little bit better than the War Boss, I'd guess, though it's kind of hard to compare the two directly, seeing as they join different units, either the Beast Boss running with some Beast Snagger Boys, or the regular War Boss perhaps running with knobs or regular boys, perhaps. Next up, we've got the Big Mech and Mega Armor, 100 points for a unit that's kind of surprisingly become an Orky Apothecary, pretty much. He gets to fix the Mega Knob's armor back together, in the form of reviving a slain model to the board each turn, Plus also his oiler model gets to restore a few wounds to one of the mega knobs once per game. He does come with some power claw attacks as well and a little bit of shooting, 
Then the option either for a 4 plus invulnerable save at range for the Mega Knob squad or a teleport blaster to chip in with a bit more shooting. I feel like the 4 plus invulnerable might be the way to go there, though it might not always matter in 10th edition if you can get some cover saves. AP3 things might be saved on a 4 plus anyway if you can keep them in cover somehow. Again, I would probably rank the Mega Armor Mech and the Mega Armor Knobs to the bottom end of Tier 2 or upper Tier 3. You do pay a bit of a premium in points for them, but I think that they could be potentially powerful if they can get their damage going and not get wiped out immediately. Next up, perhaps the most improved unit out of the entire Orc army for this edition could be Zogrod Wartsnagger. He was very underwhelming for his points cost before, just not really doing much, but now his super runs are genuinely fighting on another level to regular Gretchen. He can only join Gretchen squads, and has got fairly strong personal melee actually, hitting on a 2+, plus with strength 7, AP 2, and damage 2. Kind of hilarious that that's the same sort of profile as a Custodian Guardian Spear. It's not really a run to that you want to mess with. Otherwise, his main role in life is to give the super runs a big damage boost. He gives them plus 1 to hit and plus 1 to wound with all their attacks at shooting and melee, minus 1 to wound for attacks against them, and also scouts of 9 inches, so you can get all of those objective control to Little Gretchen into the midfield and go up an objective while being harder to remove than most. Perhaps one of the biggest things about those buffs though are that it also seems to work on the runt herds in the unit, so while they wouldn't normally be a thing to particularly consider too hard with the unit, they can be pretty punchy with these sort of buffs going on. Overall, it just seems to be hard to go too far wrong with a unit of this guy for 80 points, plus a 22 model squad of Gretchen with a couple of Ront herds thrown in, or for 170 points. Looks like it could be a fun little force to throw towards the midfield. Next up, we've got Gasgol Thracker himself, the Prophet of the War. 235 points, so a big points cut compared with previously, though he is significantly less mighty, particularly for his durability, getting a slightly lackluster toughness characteristic to be more in line with Mega Knobs. He still punches very hard with Gork's Claw at a big damage 4, and it gives his Mega Knob squad a plus 1 to hit and wound in combat, making them just massively more efficient damage dealers. I feel like Gasgol's buffs are a bit more meaningful than they were previously. You do also get Makari folded into that points cost as well. He's got the 2 plus invulnerable save that you can't re-roll, but that could be good for tanking some big hits if targeted by the right thing. If you can keep Makari alive though until the war is called, and you also get a big aura of lethal hits as well, that would be very nice to help Orcs punch up a bit against enemy vehicles and tough stuff, and could combo really nicely with that 5 plus to critical hit stratagem that you get, that way you could get both sustained and lethal hits on those attacks, which seems pretty brutal. Overall still pretty solid for the Orcs I think, maybe not quite as massively stand out as it was previously, again perhaps one of the units I would have put towards bottom tier 2, top tier 3. Next up, for 45 points, and perhaps a bit of a hidden gem in the codex, is the standard mech. He basically does standard tech marine things with healing d3 wounds and a plus 1 to hit, but when you apply that to a big orc vehicle, you could be changing something from hitting on a 5 plus to hitting on a 4, and that's a pretty massive boost to your damage output, never mind the repairs. I think if you are including a really big orc shooting vehicle, then he could be pretty much auto-include. Could be nice with a kill tank to get the plus 1 to hit out to its max range. Or could be fun with the Gorkonauts big shooter, and certainly if you're using a stomper, he looks pretty auto include. Still, though, perhaps his main problem is just a bit of a lack of really big shooting vehicles to buff. He does seem fairly auto include if you're running a fair amount of Orc firepower vehicles, though if you're not, then he's going to be far more niche. Finally, for slightly more solid Orc characters here, we've also got Boss Snickrot. Again, probably one that have been a little bit kind to including up in tier 2. Could have been at top of tier 3 as well. I feel like he's an upgrade for commandos that you might sometimes want but might not always want. An extra 105 points on the units for a whole flurry of strength 6, AP-1 and damage 2 attacks that are twin links. He makes sure his squad's always in cover which would make them a little bit tankier as well. And also gets a fun once per game redeploy too. I think at the 105 points he's strong enough to be usable. Though definitely is an auto include. I'd certainly rank the standard squad of commandos a bit higher than him just on its own. Kind of a bit sad that he doesn't have an option to go lone operative and just be fielded on his own as a bit of an orky assassin. I think that also would have been very cool. Finally, we get to tier 1, where I've just chosen to rank just a few units that I think stand out a bit above the rest for the points cost. And here I've chosen to rank the Orc Truck, the Beast Boss on the Squigasaur, and the unique Mozrog Scragbad variant, and also the Humble Gretchen Squad. I wasn't necessarily expecting to be ranking Trucks and Gretchen right at the top, but Games Workshop do seem to have just charged a very low price for them, even if they're the units that aren't exactly going to be doing the biggest damage to the enemy army. The truck at 50 points just looks very usable indeed. Toughness 8 with a 6 plus invulnerable save, 
the new transport rules to allow it to move and then disembark a unit, plus having a firing deck if you just want to remain embarked. It's picked up a strength 10 wrecking ball for free, which could be very useful if you want to use tank shock, as it average 4 mortal wounds if it charges in there. It transports 12 models, so you can have a regular squad of boys plus some characters. If it does happen to explode, you could even use that Kareen stratagem, move it around a bit and either get the boys to safety or closer to the enemy's faces. Overall, looks like a really solid way to get some boys to the front lines. A nice cheap transport choice for things like knobs or maybe beast snagger boys, perhaps. Next up, and some quite radically changed units, are the Beast Boss on Squigasaur and Mosrog Scragbad. No longer getting character protection, so the opponent can absolutely just shoot them straight away. But with their new defensive profiles, they are some of the tougher things in the entire Orc army anyway. The regular Beast Boss has Toughness 9, 10 Wounds, a 3 plus save, and a 5 plus Invulnerable save, but perhaps more importantly a 4 plus Feel No Pain. So in reality, it's more like chewing through around about 18 wounds at that profile rather than just 9. I think that's pretty hefty stuff for 165 points. It's got strong generalist melee with damage 3 squiggersaw jaws, plus a beast chopper from the boss himself to bring down some heavy hitters. He also can protect other units with a 1 CP heroic intervention to counter charge the enemy and helps out the charge of nearby beast snaggers. For the extra 30 points as well, I feel like Mosrog Scragbaz adds enough to be worth that points cost, and you could certainly feel both of us as no real restriction on fielding war bosses anymore. He gets an extra pip of damage in melee, so either damage 4 or damage 3. He gets bonus damage against any vehicles or monsters for an extra plus 1 there, or plus 2 against Titanics for a crazy damage 5 or 6. Big Chomper, the Great White Squigasaur, has an extra chance of dealing more damage, getting mortal wounds on a 5 plus on the charge, and he does have a 4 plus invulnerable save as well, which will keep him a lot safer against anti-tank weapons, with a good chance to bounce some really powerful hits. Overall seems very mighty, and just enormous general purpose damage output, Unlike a fair few things in 10th edition, he's pretty equally capable of tearing apart both big monsters and vehicles, as well as smaller squads. Finally, while boys may win fights, Grotz often win games. I think having access to Gretchen is really quite nice for the Orc army, even though they're not a unit that you probably want to go absolutely mad on. You can only take three units anyway these days, due to not being battle line. At 11 wounds for just 45 points, they're some of the cheapest wounds that you can get in Warhammer 40k, at least on individual models. You now get the Ronto built into the unit, which is pretty cool. They may be down to Toughness 2 with no real major save to speak of, but that's still going to soak up some enemy anti-infantry fire. It's more a question of how many shots the opponent can actually land, and they are going to be annoying to remove from the board for a fair few different units, things that are paying high prices for good quality attacks rather than quantity. The runt herd being built in means they don't actually have any worse leadership than other orcs, which is kind of nice. You can chip in with a tiny little bit of melee damage to help out, and just in general, piling an objective with an absolute ton of objective control two bodies is going to give you a big advantage on the primary game, and when they're there, they get to farm a command point on a 4 plus each turn. Particularly if you've got two Gretchen units on two objectives, that means that you've got a three-quarter likelihood of getting your command point per game turn. As mentioned before as well, Zogrod Wartsnagger does seem like a very reasonable choice if you're sending a Gretchen squad into the midfield. For him, plus 90 points worth of Grotz, you've got an actually fairly annoying unit to shift there, Plus the Gretchen with their plus one to hit and wound actually have a reasonable chance of doing some actual damage. Overall they seem like a unit that's pretty much auto includes to have one or two units of in the army. Obviously they're not going to be your mainline damage dealers, won't do much for that, but it's not like that's really their point in the first place. So anyway, there we have it, a bit of a discussion of each and every orc unit in the index, and a rough power ranking for them in Warhammer 40k. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Which orc units have you been having success with on the battlefields of 10th edition so far, and how would you agree with these rankings? Is there anything that should be higher or lower? If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics, or certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description below if you'd like to help support. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some really big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.